All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here today. I'm so excited to be talking about DevOps and security and how that all comes together. Um, awesome to be here with my friend, Sean and Nofar. Um, and I, I think we'll have a, a lively conversation on the topic. Um, and we look forward to your questions. So uh, please do submit those questions down into that Q&A panel. Uh, that'll, that'll always make this a lot more fun. So without any further ado, I think it's worth uh, getting in and celebrating the progress that we've all made on DevOps, right? Whether that's just in your organization, you're feeling the velocity happening and it's it's going so much better, or whether we look at like how we've come as an industry over the last 10 or 15 years, where we've moved from releasing once or twice a year to like continuous delivery and getting things out the door every couple of weeks, every week, every day, more than that. We've got a lot of great reasons to celebrate uh, and I love it. Uh, at the same time, um, yeah, we, we've got the the party crashers, right, John? Um, who are coming in from security and they're like, eh, I don't know if we should be going this fast. You guys look like you're having a little too much fun here. And maybe not being the responsible grown-up adults that y'all should be. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think when you start getting the departments of no, uh, like security showing up and kind of spoiling all your success of deploying to production 12 times a day, it can feel bad. Um, but there, there's a reason these folks are here. And um, so, so Sean, like, why are these dudes here? Well, you know, in in some ways, it's kind of apparent. I mean, security, you know, much like sales, you know, you've probably heard the expression, you know, whose responsibility or whose job is is sales in a company? And, and the answer is everyone. Everybody has some part in that. And I think, you know, security absolutely follows this the same kind of, of model that we all need to be security minded. I, you know, every developer that I've ever spoken with in recent years uh, understands this and yet um it's it's no small feat you know eric like you said to build a working and successful devops model with you know all of the right tooling and resources and you know people i i think ultimately you know th there there's a huge cultural change that needs to happen and so once you've kind of achieved that level i mean sure you're accomplishing things um, you know, whether it's uh, release frequency or efficiency or, you know, you have all these metrics that you've kind of blown past in, in very good ways. And yet um, sec security is, is very much top of mind, but many organizations are kind of trailing the level of security and sort of the, the processes and, you know, also cultural change required to really keep up and, and to keep this this whole software uh, development and deployment model intact. And so what does the cyber threat landscape look like today from the application or from the you know, development environment point of view? Well, you know, we're moving at incredible velocity and many code bases. In fact, you, know, you can see here statistically, more than 80% of code bases have, have vulnerabilities that are introduced through the use of open source components. So not only are, are we just building faster, we're using all of these incredible and widely available building blocks to create the applications that we have today. And so that really opens things up for, uh, yeah, the, the, there's there's a risk exposure there that clearly organizations, you know, in the security and compliance department are, are watching this and going, well, you know, how, how are we gonna, how, how are we gonna protect ourselves from this. Um, and there's significant risk out there. And so you've probably heard a lot of talk about supply chain and open source components and, and other software artifacts being just a, a piece of that whole software supply chain. You know, the other aspects of it are, you know, some of the, the build platforms that these artifacts are, are, are built on. And it's, it's everything that actually touches a software application as, as it's being built and deployed. And so you, you can kind of imagine that in many cases, this is a very complex kind of attack surface to try to defend. 
45% of organizations, according to Gartner, will have experienced a supply chain attack by 2025. And you know, we're just at the end of 2023. So that 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 is very significant. Security comes crashing in, you know, whether it's in a kind of moderate way or or a you know an, an alarmist way. And that could really rattle the you know software development departments and and DevOps. And I I think there's generally a good awareness that security is a top priority and, and that it needs to be inserted into DevOps. And it's really hard to put the SEC in DevSecOps, which is, you know, the model that you kind of need to, to keep everything as it is going forward. And, and there, there are some clear trade-offs and impact of of trying to to shoehorn in security processes and technologies in in the whole uh, in in the whole DevOps model, and so um, there there is good reason to to figure out how to do that and fast because you know many of you you know as you kind of scan the slide here you recognize these logos and some of the major security incidents that uh, that they represent uh, solar winds uh, for example. You know, you probably know the name Solar Winds, and you know their IT management software. There, there was um, that was targeted, and in, in a way that, as an update to that software, was distributed to all of its customers. There was a vulnerability there and a backdoor uh, through which malware was introduced, and and you know you can look at this type of attack vector as, as like it, it's a huge force multiplier in terms of the you know compliance and legal risk and and damage that it can cause to brand and you know code cov log 4j 3cx these all follow the same you know they use kind of different approaches um you know different tactics but the idea is that you compromise one piece of that software supply chain and it multiplies through all of the users and the you know the customers of, of that piece of software so you know security as an imperative, you know, we're we're all trying to figure out, you know, how do we do this, and and how do we avoid some of the common trade-offs that introducing security abruptly into the into the DevOps model um, will will cause. And so, you know, handing it back to Eric and Nofar to to talk through that. And you know, if you're a developer, you're probably going, oh yeah, this this means a lot more work and you know, mental load for me. Um, and that that is a very significant problem. That's a lot of what we're going to discuss in, in the subsequent yeah. material here. Yeah, Sean, I, I was enjoying the party. Th thanks for reminding us. <laughs> <laughs> like, why, why, why this is so serious. Um, and what I think is interesting is with issues like solar winds, right, which compromise significant infrastructure across the US government. The US government got really uh, interested in this topic real fast. Um, and so there's a great white paper that we link to uh, here. We should probably throw that into the, the chat as well. Um, coming out of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Group in the US, as well as the National Security Agency, uh, who like to hack people themselves. Um, and they really break it down as five areas that really are areas of concern when we look at DevOps platforms and how we deliver our software, these areas of vulnerability that we need to be in good control of. So first, you can always write insecure code, right? And you should check for that. You can also be consuming vulnerable artifacts. Sean was talking about Log4j, right? Most common Java logging library has a major security vulnerability that allows arbitrary code execution, which is remarkable for a logging library. Um, but everybody suddenly is vulnerable to arbitrary code execution. It was awful, right? So that's one angle that you can have problems. But you could also have an issue where your pipeline, right? How you deliver code, how you get it built and deployed, that becomes poisoned and compromised and someone's got access to it. So you could have insecurity on that pipeline leading to that, um, but you could also have insufficient pipeline access controls, right? If anybody who's in your network could 
change the configuration of your deployment pipelines, then anybody could say, oh, let's grab some random artifact. And I don't know where my camera went. Um, could grab some random artifact and deploy it on your production servers, which is obviously a security risk. Um, and then, you know, finally, I think when we're looking at this, as you, you could look into your infrastructure issues, right? If um, how you're creating infrastructure is problematic, then we could be in a situation where um, that's getting spun up and it's not appropriately locked down. It's easy to just break into your servers and that's not great either. So there are a lot of opportunities when we look across DevOps to mess things up. And so we need a fairly thorough approach to keep this secure and tidy across all of this attack surface. Um, and Sean, why don't you take us through some of that in, in more detail? Sure. So, you know, the, these are the, why I, I, I think at this point, you know, the, these are very common objectives of, of DevSecOps. Uh, what, what does good look like in the world of DevSecOps? And a lot of times, I mean, this is not a trivial problem to solve when you have, you know, three really critical stakeholders of like very different types of functions come together and figure out how to operate together to achieve um, the, the result of having a secure delivery platform, uh, of being able to test for any and all known software vulnerabilities um, and create a means for developers to effortlessly remediate those vulnerabilities to harden their code. Um, and also preventing the release of insecure code means knowing, and this also ties to number five, really knowing what ingredients you're building your code with, uh, knowing where those artifacts have been built. Um, they have a, a provenance, you know, which is a kind of an interesting term. We'll, we'll get into the meaning of that and in, in the discussion around the salsa framework, but everything that you would need to do to ensure the integrity of your software goes well beyond just testing your own code for vulnerabilities, but involves really knowing where all of your software artifacts come from and being able to ensure their integrity as you deliver your final piece of software or your, your application to your, uh, you know, whether it's an internal user or an external customer, if that's what your business is based on. So yeah, this is all great, but how can you possibly achieve that? And we see a lot of different approaches. Um, you know, to my knowledge today, there, there are no de facto standards in place on how directly to achieve this. You see a lot of very different and, and sometimes innovative approaches. Other times it's like, you know, you're trying to shoehorn some kind of security measure into the whole DevOps model. And it kind of, you know, if you've ever seen the show, nailed it, you know, somebody tries to do something very elaborate and, and sophisticated, but the end result is just sort of like a barely passable, um, you know, a, a barely passable result, right? Um, that's a start. But what we're going to talk about next is really centered around, you know, what, what are the things that you can do just sort of beyond the obvious measures that don't necessarily get you to um, that level of success? So, you know, we'll, we'll look at different approaches and, and kind of the considerations that uh, that you would need in order to create a successful model for this. Because you know, all of this really just translates to um, your DevOps processes and, and your, your entire program working the way it should, but in a much more secure manner. Yeah, so, okay. I'm trying to think through what we need to do. And look, people tend to panic, right, when, when they get through... Oh, government's saying we're we're all insecure, and you look at this. Oh, we got to lock everything down. And so, the initial reaction that I see out there a lot is to say, "Okay, uh, we need to make sure that only the right people can edit our CI/CD pipelines. We got to lock that down really strictly, like team leads only. Uh, maybe even we need a central team who will define this for everybody, so it has to be done really uh, correctly." Um, and if any of this pipeline code is sitting out in something like Git, well, we're going to need 
uh, pull reviews and, and maybe we'll need pull reviews um, from like 12 different people on, on pipeline changes to be really good and secure. And certainly before we go to production, uh, we got to be careful, right? Because anything bad could have happened. We should have a big meeting, right? Uh, with, with a lot of smart people. Uh, let's bring back our, our change advisory board, our CAB, and, and have a big meeting to do this and uh, really big approval at the end to make sure everything was done right. Um, and then we'll take everything offline every week and make sure it's all good and secure and patched. Um, and I, I think there's good and noble things here. <laughs> at the same time, if it goes overboard, this is why we were all scared when we saw the security guys knocking at the door at the start, right? It, it, we can grind things to a halt really easily. Um, and I think this talks a lot about the, the infrastructure, but we can go over the edge on uh, the checks uh, in security scans as well, right, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, building on what Eric was talking about, um, you know, the, the, the terms like, Continuous integration and continuous delivery are, are are they're in almost every piece that you read about software development today. And I think it 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 stands to reason that you know security needs to be continuous as well. Um, you know, I, I I've seen you know some material out there, some some thought leadership kind of refer to continuous security, and really this translates to a lot of the processes that you would put in place in alignment with your CI CD pipelines in a, in a way that makes it easy for developers uh, to deal with. And so here what you know what we're showing you know in this simple pipeline is some of the that sort of you know 101 level approach to DevSecOps, um, a lot of times security is really backloaded, meaning like you've done all of your or the, the majority of your development work, and, and then you're gonna run all of these security scans. You're gonna test your code and, and the security team is gonna generate all of these results, taking the output of their scanners, and they're gonna go, ah, oh, you know, we found 360 vulnerabilities. Um, let's just give this back to our development team and you know, they'll they'll sort through it and, and fix it. And that's kind of what happens. You, you as a developer, you get a spreadsheet if you're lucky. <laughs> um, and then you're sort of left to to figure out, all right, well, wh which ones of these are critical? Um, and hey, wait a second, I'm going through this list. And frankly, I'm spending a lot of time on this. I'm spending a lot of time not coding. I'm just going through this list seeing, you know, duplicates of vulnerabilities because there, there's so many different scanners available in each in each category. Um, you may get duplicate results. And so waiting too long and having that delay in that information coming back to you, that, that doesn't work. That's not really continuous. That's sort of security at one point and then a long pause, and then maybe you repeat that cycle. And so the recommended methodology here is um, you know, to, 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 do, to basically start from the drawing board and introduce an approach to security in your pipelines that that solves two things. Number one, you surface as many vulnerabilities as you can, but you do it in a way that you can actually, you're not pulling your developers away from the, the work that they are paid to do. Um, and you're not creating massive headaches. And I think, um, you know, no far, like you can go into like a lot more detail sort of like what are we seeing out there in terms of like what, what does it take to be able to achieve that, and what you know what what's sort of the the impact you know to developers there? All right, thanks, John. So yeah, I mean both John and Eric, you know, kind of gave an overview of what we've seen you know businesses doing in the past, right? How their security teams work. So a lot of organizations out there, you know, have you know realized right that doesn't work well. This approach of generating, you know, finding these issues late in, late in the game and getting all this vulnerability in an Excel to the developer, that it just, you know, increases the fri friction and, and delays, right, uh, uh, remediation and, you know, of these issues. So what we've started seeing uh, customers doing in this industry is shift left. And I'm sure everybody probably on the call have heard about shift left, right? It's not a new concept. 
Uh, but shift left had its own challenges, right? So what we have seen, first of all, you know, it is it is a big cultural change, right? So we now saying, okay, we want to shift left. That means that now we have to run these scans as early as possible. So maybe in your CI solution, you're already running uh, um, static you know, scans, right? Or container scanning before we even you know, package an artifact, right? So the idea is to pull all these tests as early as you can in the game. But that brings you know, a new set of challenges, okay? Now, so who, who, who owns this work right now? So let's say you're, the, you know, I'm a developer, which I was in, you know, ancient history, and now I'm told, okay, uh, now you need to go and put all these security uh, measures in your pipeline. So before you go and push your uh, Docker container with your code to, you know, Docker Hub, you have to make sure that this is scanned properly. So now I have to figure out, you know, what's next, right? So maybe I'm gonna go and look at some open source solutions. Uh, that I'm out there for container scanning, maybe, or or for dependency scanning, or for other, for whatever scan you know that I may need to incorporate in my pipeline, right? So now that means that now the the load is on me. So now I'm a developer that's not really an expert in security. I uh, need to figure out how to find the right tools, how to integrate them in my pipeline. And, and the most difficult task, what to do with these results, right? So now, okay, so I've done the work and now I have all these security scans in my pipeline and I get the results and then what? What does it actually mean to me? How do I know which one I need to prioritize? Which ones can actually go to production, right? Because maybe they're not that severe. And then there might be a back and forth in Slack with someone from security teams or something like that, right? Or, you know, to figure out what I, I, I should fix. So, so shift left is great, but what we want to do, what we are offering in Harness is the you know, uh, ability or what good looks like, right? Is the ability to uh, shift left the information and not the workload, right? So this is what we feel is the, the ideal scenario. So how do you pack this information uh, um, in, in a way that is meaningful, meaningful for the developers, that they know what to do with that in information. So they don't have to go and be experts on security and they don't need to necessarily figure out how to build these all integrations themselves. And they have an easy way to understand, you know, what's important and, and, and what's not. And also an easier way to, to work with the developer team. Because shifting left, the workload, right, without shifting the data and, and putting all this load, basically all these efforts in the developer's hand, does the opposite. So sure, you might be checking for security issues early on, but now you have developers that rather than actually crafting code, creating innovation, they need to spend some time on security and it slows delivery down and it makes developers less happy, which of course, you know, everybody wants the developers to be, to be happy. And just degrades, right, the overall developer experience. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do we put the, you know, security in software delivery without killing the developer, you know, experience and slowing them down? And for that, there are, there are multiple approaches, multiple principles that uh, we can take. So first of all, we need to, to, to empower each team to do the right things, to do what they are good at. If a developer needs to now go and implement their own security scans, it's a waste of time. There are people in the company that are experts in security and they can go and, and set the policies, right? Say, okay, these are the security scanners that we are working with. This is what you need to run in your CI phase. This is what you need to run in this CD phase. Encapsulate that into reusable templates, right? So everybody can uh, just use it. So no one needs to reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, and, and also let's say they did it. Okay. So the security team are awesome and they've created the best templates. And now all the, you know, developers theoretically might use these templates. You also need to make sure to, to, to make sure you, uh, you have a way to ensure that they're using these templates. Right. And this is where another challenge comes in, which is policies. So how do you how do you do that without slowing down developers? So let's say now I'm a developer and I want my autonomy, right? And I want to be able to do my work, create my pipelines. Uh, how will I even know that there's a template that is there for me to use? 
And how do you make sure that I'm actually using that? So if you have a good, you know, policies in place, that will help you out, right? So developers, for example, we try to push an image to Docker Hub, but your policy engine can detect, okay, right, the preliminary step for pushing a, um, um, a, an image to Docker Hub is to run these templates for scanning. Now go ahead and do that before you can move forward, right? So if you have uh, something like that in place, then you have basically autonomy with guardrails, right? You can make sure uh, the processes are done properly. So the developers are focused on what they know how to do best. They write them code. They're not expected to become security experts. And the security teams know how to put the policy, policies in place and the templates in, in place in order to enable the developer to do, to do their work. Um, and this way, basically, you know, we make it easier and right to do the right things and make it hard to do the wrong things. If you have policies in place, someone really, 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 really need to work very hard, right? Uh, you know, to, to uh, game the system. So it just basically takes the developers down the path of, of best practices and what, you know, and do the right things and make it very hard for someone to do the wrong thing. And, and I think another another thing that we we see from from uh, some uh, of our customers, especially those that have already done that, right? They already shifted the uh, left and they shifted the left properly, and they have the policies and they have the templates. They want to take it even a step further to to make it um, risk based, basically it's for risk based decision making. So because once you have uh, something like that in in place. You can really play with the level of security that is really needed in each uh, step of, of the way. So maybe you have a documentation site, a developer hub. And that's, you know, while of course this is super, super important, I mean, the risk might be slower, you know, to that site compared to something that is in the core, you know, uh, in the heart of your business. Maybe you're a hotel and you have a booking system and now you take, you know, people's, you know, information and credit cards, right? And this is, something with a risk profile that is much larger. So, so risk-based decision-making basically means you don't have to set the same scans and the same policies and the same you know, approvals uh, for everything, right? But as long as you have these building block, block, blocks in, in place, you can make the right decision of which gates, which standards uh, to comply with in each of your application, in each of the uh, use cases. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Sean to dive, deep dive a little bit uh, deeper into how we do it right. Yeah, no further. I, I think that was just excellent perspective. So you shared, you know, two really great insights and and sort of the guiding principles. You know, what you what what you shift left ultimately matters. It, and you know, shifting a, a whole workload left that that will break your DevSecOps model. And you know, making it easy to do the right things and hard to do the wrong things. I mean, like, like great principle. Um, you know, I'll talk a bit more from the security side of things. How do how do you make those two? You know, how do you enable those two principles to play out in how you operate in your DevSecOps framework? And I think you know, automation is such a big part of that. Um, and so, you know, when you do look at, you know, how am I going to build my security pipeline? How do I want it to operate in accordance with, with those two principles, you know, having guardrails, but also like what, what you shift left and let's say even how often you do it, you know, should be the function of a really thoughtful automation. So I, you know, taking, taking that concept and sort of laying it out in terms of, you know, again, you know, here's your basic, um, software development pipeline, um, what you're seeing here, you know, the, the blue logos are, you know, the, the different categories of tests and, and where, you know, this is just kind of a general suggestion where, where you would run these. And so you've got all kinds of different security scanners, uh, you know, static application security testing, dynamic application security testing, container scanning, you know, you can go on it. And there are a myriad of options in each category. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we, we often talk to, uh, you know, customers and, and, and folks in the industry about is like, you know, what, what, and, you know, or, or I should say, which ones and how many, you know, different independent security scanners are using, be they open source or commercially available. And so, 
there, there is such an abundance of what you can use and there's freedom of choice, which is ultimately good, but sometimes you get a little too far over your skis and you're, you've just got too many tools to manage. So taking more of a platform approach, um, that's something that we see a lot of preference for, uh, particularly in, in, in much larger kind of DevOps um, practices. So being able to execute security scans, but also the, the governance piece is really key here. And again, a, a very important piece of automation to create and using a policy as code approach with the open policy agent. Um, you know, for those of you that are um, you know, well versed in in the, the cloud native <clears throat> computing foundation ecosystem, you know, OPA was a hugely successful project. It, it's got you know, millions and millions of downloads, a uh, huge global community around it. It's such a an important, um, it, it's such a, it's such an important piece of technology because you can apply policy as code to all these different areas of your stack. And in this particular use case, we're using it to govern the, you know, if you want to call it the passage, you know, moving a um, a piece of software onto the next phase. Um, you know, pending that it passes whatever security checks that, that you have in place. That that's one where we we typically use it. And so it's really valuable in making sure that you're not um deploying insecure code. And so, you know, as as you run all these scans and and tests through your pipeline, you know, you stand a very good chance of of really nailing down vulnerabilities early and then remediating them. Um in an ideal situation, you know, for the sake of your developers, you would provide them with not only a deduplicated and prioritized list of vulnerabilities, but you know, AI is is you know is so incredibly hot now. The use case in 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 this particular um, model is to to use AI to to create um, guidance on how to remediate. Uh, vulnerabilities. And so what does that mean for the developer? Well, it, it's just, it's dead simple. You have security running continuously and you have, you're, you're doing it as as kind of like far to the left as, as you possibly can to close that feedback loop. And so a developer can easily get a list of vulnerabilities they can work on and, and not have to um, spend too much time figuring out how to do it. It's It's more uh, more of a turnkey process. So th this is a really great model to to try and achieve. And that's really, you know, for the, the code that you're building uh, in your organization. So, you know, we talked to, earlier on in, in, in the webinar about supply chain security. And, and so like, if, if you kind of, if you go up to, you know, the, the 10 or 15,000 foot view and you're looking at your own code, but all of the components that go into producing your end piece of software, your, your end application, um, the supply chain is is very much in focus. And again, this is really the this is the attack surface that you need to be able to defend. Um, the, the brand reputation, um, legal and compliance risk. I mean, th th this all kind of hangs in the balance of that. Um, Many of you may be familiar. A couple of years ago, and this is actually pretty recent, um, the president had issued an executive order. It's Executive Order One Four Zero Two Eight, and the purpose of that was really to strengthen the nation's cybersecurity posture. Um, but when you dig into the details of of what's required and and how that ultimately could be achieved, um, there there are there are two components to this here that I'm calling out because, you know, these have um, major repercussions for software producers. The first is the software bill of materials. You know, essentially it's it's your very detailed and incredibly long. In fact, you know, this is like a machine readable list of all of the components included in a particular software artifact. Um, it's dependencies, third-party libraries, and everything that goes into a piece of software should be detailed in the software bill of materials. And that's something that I, I think in uh, government organizations are now required to get this from the uh, producers of the software that they use. It was a means of, of, of really making sure that they're, they're getting 
um, you know, something that that's they're, they're getting a known piece of software for which the integrity can be uh, can be attested. Um, on that note, um, there's also Salsa, which is supply chain levels for software artifacts. This is a whole uh, detailed standard for um, what are the controls that you need to have in place to prevent tampering and just in, ensure the integrity and the provenance of, of the software that, that you're producing. Um, and, and clearly for the building blocks that you're using to build your own software. So um, I, I did actually covered it in, in the previous slide, but just you know, showing you in a little more detail, you know, th this is ultimately what, what Salsa is aimed at. There, there are currently three levels um, as you go up in level, you, you're in, you're going into like very fine detail as to you know where was a particular software artifact built, um, you know what what branch was it built. Um, it could be there could be information required about which individuals worked on it. So this is very fine tuned kind of information as to like where a piece of software comes from, and the whole. The, you know, the purpose of using this framework is really to reduce your security and compliance risk. Because, you know, going back to some of the supply chain attacks that, that we talked about earlier, um, in a lot of cases, you don't really have the visibility into the open source components you're building your code with. Um, and, and that's a huge blind spot that um, following the Salsa uh, compliance framework can help solve. So when you look at securing the software supply chain, and again, using the same kind of uh, guiding principles that Nofar talked about, you know, guardrails in place, having a level of automation, and, and making sure that, you know, none of this just falls on, on the developer kind of breaking their flow and taking them away from, you know, what they need to be doing ultimately, uh, which is coding and, and, and building innovative uh, new components or, or applications. But but here you can see how we've kind of laid out um, in the red shields what you would do at these specific stages. So in building your software artifact, you definitely want to be able to, uh, to attest the provenance of a particular software artifact, meaning that you would kind of look at oh, where, did, where is this coming from? What version is it? You know, what, what branch of the um of the software development did it come from and other details like that. And so you can also generate your own salsa provenance and you are attesting that, you know, this, this piece of code again, built um, according to, you know, similar details, right? Then you can generate and attest a software bill of materials. So again, building a, a complete listing in detail of everything that's in your particular software. And so, this process of either generating or, or verifying salsa provenance, I mean, that that's that's hugely impactful in being able to say that you've delivered a, a piece of software that is like high integrity and um and and, and really the, the blind spots are eliminated um by by doing that. One thing you'd you'd want to be able to do as well is is let's say there's a zero day vulnerability that is discovered, and this is not something your scanners are going to pick up, uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, those will will surface known vulnerabilities, but you should have the ability, or at least a game plan, and the tooling to be able to go back and say, well, okay, given that this vulnerability was found in some open source piece of software. Um, we need to trace this back to the impacted components in, in our application. And so being able to do that is, is a huge advantage. And that, that, that is an all hands on deck uh, exercise um, in many cases, but this is kind of what you would do. And again, you can, you, you can look to use policy as code as a means of really making sure that these steps are followed throughout your pipeline. There's a lot that goes into this obviously, <clears throat> but, um, but again, like I, I think a lot of the guidance here in in how to build this DevSecOps model, but you know, in a way that you're not only achieving your security goals, but you're really being mindful of your developers and the you know ultimately their experience. I mean, almost every company out there is a software company. 
And it, it, this is the lifeblood of organizations today. So if you if you've got a a, a core of software developers that are just you know they're rocking and rolling they they're you know ultimately focused on innovating coding and not being pulled in a million different directions because of um, security incidents and they've got a working model where they can work with IT operations and security to you know keep this um, you know keep this this whole flow going that's that's what success looks like it's hard to get there but uh, i think you know one of the interesting things about this particular industry segment is that you know we're kind of building this as we go and we're continuously improving uh how we do this and with that um i'm going to pass it over to eric to to just wrap things yeah. up yeah or q a no like like 15 minutes ago i was willing to uh, grind everything to a halt and lock everything down so that we could be super duper secure. But uh, thank you, Nafar and Sean, for walking me through it because now I get it. And that, that idea of the zero day vulnerability kind of points out that the ability to go fast, right, to make a change today, like awesome for innovation, clearly, and it's what I love, but that's also critical if we want to respond to a zero day, right? We've got to be able to go, oh no, log4j? Where do we have it? Where's the new version? Let's get it swapped in there, tested, validated, out the door, into production, in a secure, fast way. And if everything is locked down and slow, we can't do it, right? Like speed is important for being secure, not just for innovation. So this makes sense, right? We need to have an appropriately controlled DevOps platform. People shouldn't be able to hack into it easily. Okay, that, that we can do up front. That makes sense. But when it comes to the security testing or SAST or DAST, all of those things you were talking about, right? We can't have developers spend all day like fine tuning security stuff. It's not what they're best at. It's not best for security. It's not best for innovation. Let the security teams set up the right tools, let them set up everything, but make sure that the pipeline executes it all. It's nice and fast, and we get feedback to our developers in a really clean way. And while we empower them to control their own pipelines, we do build some policies in place, right? I, you mentioned OPA as a good way of doing it. Um, we put in some policies so they can't like say, oh, I don't like the security stuff. Let's remove it, right? It like has to happen, but otherwise they're in good control. Um, when the pipeline runs, we let our developers get the security information back to them in ways that are easy to manage and fast. Cool, I get that. Uh, Dedupe it, prioritize it, make it actionable. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, let to make sure that we're generating our S bombs, complying with salsa, all of that. The pipelines can do that. Uh, we should be able to automate all that stuff too. Um, so yeah, I, I see how we can go fast while having the security guys part of the party. Uh, so they might not be dressed to party, but uh, <laughs> I, I think they can hang out with us. I get it. Um, so I, I think life is good again. I, I was pretty worried <laughs> 20 minutes ago. Cool. All right. Um, so thanks so much uh, for for walking us through that. Um, we're going to sh shift to Q and A here, um, and I want to thank everybody for attending. As we move into that, there is a Q and A panel, I believe, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you want to ask more questions, we already have a few coming in. Um, at Harness, we are a software delivery platform. We do work hard to keep it secure and make all this. Uh, security testing and supply chain governance, really, really easy. Um, no big surprise, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I think there's um, a couple I of questions. I question, Eric, about us. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I'll uh, read the question first. I'm not sure if you all can see it or not. But the question was how to find balance between security scans integration and CI CD pipeline processing speed. Uh, as for big projects, security scan can significantly increase the build time. And for big teams with multiple branches, we can get uh, huge build queues and decrease in team performance. 
So that's a, that's an excellent question. Before we talk specifically about uh, you know uh, the scanning and how long they take, I think the first thing that came to you know immediately jump to me is that you have queues, um, build queues. So regardless of what you're running in in your builds, uh, I think that would be the first thing uh, to look at because uh, one of the requirements, in my opinion, for a good you know CI CD solution for a good DevOps platform is that it can scale with organization needs. And, you know, uh, engineering time is uh, very precious. And uh, if the engineers need to spend time sitting, you know, waiting in queues for the bills to run, I think this is, uh, to the, you know, not a great uh, situation to be in. And, and as a developer in my past, you know, it's very frustrating from a developer's perspective. But let, let's talk uh, now about the core, you know, the, the, the core of the question. Um, what can we do basically um, to avoid it? So, so I think there are a few things that you can do. First of all, decide when to run the scans. So developer teams, of course, they, you know, each developer, if I need to fix a bug or something like that, I will open, you know, a feature branch and I'm going to work on my branch. And if you do have a very lengthy, you know, testing, maybe you don't, a security scan, maybe you don't want to run it necessarily on each commit. Maybe for your own company specifically, the right thing would, would be to have some trigger conditions and maybe only run certain security scans um, only for PR, uh, pull requests like for the main branch, for example, right? So depending on the, the risk, depending on the scope of what you're testing on the branch, right? Using uh, triggers and trigger conditions, you can basically make decisions um, of what to run uh, where. And also in, in runtime, you know, itself, right? As a part of the pipeline, you might want to have some condition. If the target branch, for example, is not main, then you can maybe skip a certain stage or a certain, certain you know, process. And that's not specific for security scan. I mean, that's any time you have, you know, I mean, for example, it can be relevant for integration testing. It can be relevant for any, you know, for other types of testing. If you have unit tests that takes a long portion of the time. Um, I mean, I would also look at places where it can be optimized. I mean, I would revisit, you know, what kind of security scans you're running and in one, you know, in, in which scenarios. Um, but this, this is the, the, the few things that I would uh, look out for, how to optimize the test, making sure you're writing the, the you know, making the, making sure you, you're running the right security scans where it's really needed and makes sense to run them. And I would definitely look at this build queue uh, things and see how I can, you know, scale up my system. So I'm not slowed down by that. I hope that uh, helps. That was a really great question, actually. Uh, there's one more here, which which is also very interesting. Um, you know, one, one of our attendees is asking, you know, can we talk about some of the mechanisms or tools that would allow for giving developers autonomy with guardrails? Uh, for example, how do you prevent dev teams from turning off security steps? So that that's that's interesting. I'm, you know, I'll offer up just one perspective, sort of from the DevSecOps um, process side of things. I think, um, yeah, that that may be. I, I think the answer to that, uh, I'm going to defer to you, Eric, but that may lie on you know some of the security mechanisms in in your platform. Um, but I think that there are cases where you may have an an, an exception. Um, where there's a vulnerability that would otherwise cause your your pipeline to break, but for for maybe good reason, you can create a security exemption, in which case you know that would be something that you you would do with your security team, and that could be managed um, in a way so that it's it's not you know holding up your um, your deployment. So that that that's something that you you may want to have as a capability or at least a uh, a process in your pipeline to handle security exemptions because they do they do come up. But I think what you're asking, uh, it probably the answer to that lies in uh, some of the security mechanisms of your platform. Yeah, so I, I think there's um, there's a couple elements here. I think one that idea of hey let's let's make sure the software is getting better, right? Overall, so we might have a lot of security issues in our software today when we start scanning. 
And we don't want to say we'll never ship to production until we have zero, right? That's not realistic. Um, so we do want to clue in on things like uh, what's new. Now on this one, like how do I make sure that my development teams can manage their own pipelines, but they can't turn off the security steps? What we're seeing is a move towards separating edit permissions on the pipeline and the enforcement of policies about the configuration of that pipeline, or um, you can't go to production unless the pipeline meets some criteria. And so evaluating those things separately. And so Sean was talking earlier about the idea of the open policy agent, OPA, right? And that's one way of expressing a policy. In order to deploy to production, my pipeline must have executed these sorts of security steps and they must have passed to some sort of a level. And so we've separated the policy from um, the, the pipeline rules themselves. And that allows you to let people edit the pipeline more freely. Um, so at Harness and our technology, we use OPA, we're big fans of it. I think the other major technology that I've seen banging around in the space is Kyverno, which is straight Kubernetes. There's probably a couple more out there, but this idea of find a policy agent and layer it over your pipeline allows you to make that kind of thread that needle, right? Of like, how do I let people edit, but not turn things off? Because if you can edit, you can turn it off, right? Like, no, you have a policy outside of the pipeline that solves that. Um, so I, I think that makes sense. Um, I guess I, I was talking a bit about um, how we do kind of the edit, but guardrails, we use OPA. Um, Sean, there, there's some questions here that are essentially how the deduplication works, what our approach to that in Harness is. Do you wanna talk to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. So one, one of the things that that we offer with our DevSecOps solution, so that, that's based on, on two different modules. There's security testing orchestration and then another module dedicated to software supply chain assurance. Um, you, you basically, um, with, with STO, for example, you know, that, that is what gives you the ability to orchestrate security tests throughout the pipeline and, you know, flexibility to integrate whichever um, open source or, or commercial scanners that you want to use. And, and invariably, you know, you're going to use combinations of, of scanners at different points, uh, perhaps like just different scanners of, of a specific type, but the deduplication is something that, that we automate under the hood. And when you get your scanner output, instead of like in, in the classic, um, you know, and sort of like taking those first steps of, hey, we, you know, we've identified these vulnerabilities and then you have no mechanism of, resolving that list into a manageable process for, for your developers. Um, what this does is this, you know, it, if you're in the harness platform, you'll, you'll see a categorization, you know, there, there are basically four levels of vulnerabilities and uh, there's this critical high medium and, and low, you know, which I think is pretty common, but uh, but all of that is presented in a way that's just easy to, you know, we've, we've triaged it for you and then um, it'll identify which ones are duplicates. You know, they may come from I don't know, two different scans from the same scanner or they may come from two different scanners entirely. But um, but that's something that, that we do under the hood. And then, you know, companion to that is really the remediation guidance. So just offering up... Um, a few easy steps and, and some context around, you know, what does this vulnerability really mean? And <clears throat> what are the recommended approaches for, for resolving it? So those are two things that, that, that we do and we can present back to developers, um, you know, post-scan. And if I, if I may add to that, uh, Sean, yeah, just a comment. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I think that the, the key here is also how simple you, you make it, right? So theoretically I can take, you know, other, uh, you know, different type of CI, CD solution, different type of platform. And I'm sure there are a lot of things they could do in order to hack and script and create these policies and, and try to build these processes. But the key really lies in how, how, how easy it is. And 
And you've mentioned that in, in, in a few words, right? What we do is at Harness is we, we talked about, you know, shifting left information and not like the processes and the workload, right? So the developer really, from the developer's perspective, just gets a, a, a deduplicated list of prioritized issues that they should care about. They can easily see what, um, what um, security vulnerabilities were in the baseline versus, you know, what was introduced in their own code, right? So, you know, maybe, you know, you don't want to introduce anything new, but maybe something was there before and it's okay. If there are some violations, right, you have a built-in extension process, right? So you don't have to go to Slack and emails and something, right, to, to talk to the security teams. And so, so really the key is how, how easy we make, you know, we make it or your CI2D platform makes it for you to, to, to implement these processes. For example, you know, policies, right? Some people might think, you know, oh, policies, oh my, oh my God, this is, you know, I need to, to learn another thing and this is another, you know, language, but, you know, we, we make it super simple, right? Because you can just use um, AI policy and in a natural language, tell us what you want the policy to do and boom, you have a policy created for you, right? And if you have security vulnerabilities, I mean, again, we use AI, for example, for, you know, to suggest fixes and how to remediate it, right? So you don't have to be a security expert. So, you know, there are a lot of things. It's not just the end result. It's how easy it is to get to this state in, in the product. Awesome. Well, I think we are running out of time here. So... If anyone wants to learn more about Harness, you can go to Harness.io. I've also dropped links in the chat to how we approach DevSecOps, as well as a wonderful study about a customer who's doing this sort of stuff and saw a lot of success. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us and pass it back to Candice with the Linux Foundation to wrap up. Thank you so much, Eric Nofar and Sean, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.